wanted to welcome everyone who's joining us for the fourth in the series um, focusing on ethnobotany. Um, and as you're entering into the webinar, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself in the chat um, to say what your name is and where you're from. Um, and you could say your line of work or your experience with um, ethnobotany, if you'd like. And when you enter your name, make sure that it's to all participants, to everyone, not just the panelists. And after, we'll set aside, it depends on how long the conversation goes, but we'll try and set aside some time for questions. And if you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A, not the chat. Um, so that we can keep track of them. Um, and again, those of you who are joining, welcome. Um, we'll just take another minute to let you get settled and introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, so as I've mentioned, this is the fourth in the series of ethnobotany webinars that's being co-hosted by the American Botanical Council and Sustainable Herbs Program. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen for a moment um, to let you know some upcoming webinars that we have. Um, on January 7th, we'll, I'll be speaking with um, Wade Davis about cultural and biological diversity, really sort of the cultural underpinnings of medicinal plant knowledge and the work he's been doing. And then on February 4th, I'll be speaking with Stephen King about the work he's been doing for, I don't know, almost 30 years, looking at, um, looking for sources of medicinal plants and the cultural and economic and political framing of that. Um, so I hope you can join us for those two webinars and that information is on the Sustainable Herbs Program website. Um, and the other series of webinars that we're having are related to the toolkit that we've created around best practices for botanical companies to incorporate sustainable and regenerative practices into their um, companies. Um, and so on January 24th, 21st, I'm especially excited about a webinar that I'm having with um, producer group from India and Nepal and Peru. And the idea of these webinars is really to bring in different voices um, and take advantage of this time when we're all at home and connected on the internet to bring in voices that we can't often hear. Um, and so these will be um, producer groups talking about the impacts of COVID on the wild crafting and cultivating medicinal plants, um, as well as just their perspective on sourcing botanicals in a global network. Um, so again, all this information is on the Sustainable Herbs Program website. Um, and then all of these webinars are made possible both through the support of American Botanical Council members and then the inaugural underwriters and donors of the Sustainable Herbs Program. Um, and as you can see, there's a really varied, diverse group here of really excellent companies. You can find more information on them on our website. Um, and so with that, I am thrilled to turn to today's webinar. Um, and I'm really honored to be here with Nancy Turner and Lee Joseph, um, both of whom I've only recently met. Um, and I'm thrilled to have a, an hour to speak with them and learn about their work. Nancy Turner, most of you have known, know of. She's worked with First Nation elders and cultural specialists in Northwestern North America for more than 50 years. Um, she's collaborated with in, indigenous communities to help document, retain, and promote their traditional knowledge of plants and habitats. Um, she's written numerous articles and books. Um, and as you know, there's a, um, she's, they have a recent edited volume and there will be a coupon code that we'll send out after the, the webinar. Um, I was speaking with Wade Davis the other day, preparing for the webinar in January. And he said that Nancy Turner is one of the world's finest ethnobotanists. And he also said that she consistently ranks as one of the greatest teachers at the University of Victoria. Um, so I'm thrilled to welcome Nancy here. Um, and I'm also thrilled to welcome Lee Joseph. Um, and Lee, and I'll speak about this, but Lee began as Nancy's student in ethnobotany as an undergraduate. And she's now working on her doctorate at the University of Montreal. She's a member of the Squamish First Nation and she's collaborating with First Nation communities in her teaching and her research. 
um, and it, uh, really looking forward to their insights around navigating these very different ways of knowing. Um, and so with that introduction, I'd love to invite Lee to talk a little bit about how you came to ethnobotany um, and the work you're doing. Yeah. Hi, Chika. Thank you, Anne. I'll start with an introduction in my um, indigenous language uh, as has been taught to me by my cultural teachers. So Hotsquile, Lee Joseph Quinsna, Stiawet Kwashaman, Aunwanoxton, Squalowin, Eochton, Sequetels, Skoomish, Ochomeo, Haichka. So hello, my name is Lee Joseph. My ancestral name is Stiawet, and I come from the Squamish First Nation, which is based on the west coast of British Columbia in Canada about 50 kilometers north of Vancouver. Um, our traditional territory covers uh, in all, all through Vancouver and then up to um, Whistler for anyone who's familiar with this territory in this area. Uh, I'm so happy to be here today. I'm, um, as Anne mentioned, I'm an ethnobotanist. I'm pursuing my, my doctorate in uh, ethnobotany and really my passion um, lies in renewing cultural practices and knowledge and connection to culturally important plants. And within that, or along that path, it's also uh, really aligned with my own personal um, path of reconnection to culture and what it means to ground my identity in land-based knowledge and practice. And so uh, I was a student of Nancy's and my path to ethnobotany really started um, you know, over, over about 10 years ago when I decided I wanted to uh, pursue post-secondary studies and I attended a talk at the Vancouver Library uh, where Nancy was talking about ethnobotany and it just, uh, that talk really um, aligned in so many ways and I was so excited to find this area of study that I could pursue that integrated, uh, you know, my connection to the land, my childhood memories and love of plants that I really only sort of revisited at that point in my life when I thought about what I wanted to do in terms of meaningful studies and work. And from there, I uh, went back to pursue um, my undergraduate in um, biology so that I could then uh, pursue my master's with Nancy, which is the path that it took. And I just have to say from day one of that path, uh, Nancy was and has been and continues to be such um, a wonderful mentor and friend. And so I'm so happy to be here today with her and able to have this talk. Thank you, hi Chika. Thank you, Lee, so much. And thank you, Anne. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm here on Protection Island off Nanaimo in the traditional territory of the Snanaimoch Coast Salish peoples. And I want to acknowledge their care of this land for thousands of years. And also to, to acknowledge the many indigenous nations here in Canada and throughout North America and the world um, who hold such valuable knowledge about their home places that um, all of us need to respect. Um, I want to, uh, I wanted to share my screen and uh, show you a little, just a few photos that I, I have um, about, of Lee and, uh, and then tell you a little bit of a story, um, as well as acknowledging um, my many teachers and mentors over the years. But first of all, I want to also thank the American Botanical Council, the Sustainable Herbs Program, Anne Ambricht and, and Anna Jackson and Mark Blumenthal and uh, a lot of other folks who have done so much to promote uh, the use of natural plants and natural medicines. And the work you've done has been so important over so many years. Um, I also want to thank all of you who are joining us today because, um, well, it, it, although we can't see you, uh, um, I saw names of many, many friends as you sign up and it's great to see, see you there and think about you and all the 
good times we've had over so many years. So I just want to share this screen and I'll try and do it properly. Um, desktop. Here we are and view. And there we are. Um, I happen to have quite a few pictures of Lee along with my other graduate students, but um, I just thought it would be fun to show you these very quickly. Uh, so you can see we've had a long time relationship and it goes back. Um, one of the, the key times that we spent was out at a house at doing pit cooking and um, I think this photo of Lee's partner, who is a medical doctor, calls him Lee Lee um, because his name is Lee, spelt differently, um, with Dr. Richard Atlio Umik from Mahouset. And Lee's dad, Chief Floyd Joseph, has been uh, an important influencer in her life, as she will tell you. And He's been also participating in some of our activities. It's been so good to get to know him. Uh, we spent a lot of time out on the Kingcom River area and uh, we, we worked with, uh, I'll tell you about Clan Chief Adam Dick, um, but his upbringing was there and he participated in the Tidal Marsh root gardens. And so we were trying to restore and recreate some of those with Lee and some of the other graduate students, including linguist Melissa King and Grimes and uh, people from the community there as well. And if, you, if you're out with Lee much, you'll know that she loves being around kids. Here she is with Quaxistala, clan chief Adam Dick, and she's drying seaweed in one of our adventures, picking seaweed with some of the other um, grad students again. She's been to our Society of Ethnobiology meetings and we went to Ottawa together as well one time. Here she is teaching kids at her Squamish Nation and in downtown uh, the Squamish urban area at the community garden. And up in the Nass Valley at Gitwin Silk with the Niska Nation um, she was joining us there too, and she and Lee have spent time up in the Taltan country in the north um, with Dr. Judy Thompson Adosti. Uh, there, Judy's getting her PhD and Lee her master's at this special ceremony uh, in First People's House at UVic. So there we are in one of our adventures, and I also want to acknowledge the many, many other teachers and elders who have been part of our lives going back a long ways, but um, with uh, uh, over in the corner here with Annie York from Spasm and the Tlkatmukh Nation, with Dr. Mary Thomas of the Shwetmukh Nation, um, down here with, whoops, went, went the wrong way here, just a minute. Um, Loose Jean, Dr. Arvid Charlie, we're just coming out with a book called Loose Jean's Plants that should be out next spring. He's from the Cowichan Nation, Hulkamitnam speaker, and uh, a wonderful, knowledgeable, um, and wonderful friend and elder. And Kwaxistala Watla, we say that because he's passed away now, um, but Clan Chief Adam Dick uh, was, has been a great teacher for us. And I just will finish this little introduction uh, by acknowledging Kwaxistala Wafla and his partner, Kim Raquel Makludasi, Okwalokwa of the Qualicum Nation. And uh, she, is, uh, she and Adam together taught us a great deal about medicines and she herself uses medicines a lot, herbal medicines, including um, the, the one that we call Old Man's Beard Lichen. And I'll end with a quick story. We were heading out to Kingcom on the boat and Lee and Lee, Lee, Lee were with us. 
and Adam had just been released from the hospital and he had a, an infected wound on his arm from an IV and his arm was swollen and it was getting redder and redder and we thought wondered if we should try to get him to the hospital at Alert Bay but he didn't want to go and we got to Kingcom and we decided to try to use the old man's beard lichen asnea longissima and we got a big bunch of it and we poured hot water on it in the in the direct using the directions of my friend John Thomas from the Dididat nation who called it Indian bandage Indian bandage and we poured hot water on it and we plastered it on his arm with Lee with Dr. Lee's um, kind of careful administration and he drew a line where the swelling was uh, to make sure that it, to see wh whether it would come down or not and after a very short time the swelling totally disappeared and we didn't have to take Adam to the hospital at all and that's just one example of how um, indigenous medicine has been used uh, on many occasions. I've heard so many stories and seen myself so many instances where these wonderful medicines that are found in the lands and waters around us are healing. So with that, I will <laughs> um, turn it back to Anne to uh, continue. Thank you, Nancy, for that introduction and story. Um, Lee, I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more. You know, you talked some about your introduction to ethnobotany, but um, often there's been a history of ethnobotanists going away and then coming home. For you, it's been a way of coming home in a way to the land of your father's side, I think. And, and you've talked about it as a gateway back to your that community. And I, Wondered if you could talk about that, the, um, what it's meant to you as a person. Sure. Yeah. So I come from a um, basically just two two different backgrounds. I come from a Coast Salish background from Squamish and Sunamuk, um, Nanaimo, in the territory that Nancy is calling in from today. On my father's side and on my mother's side, I come from Jewish and English ancestry. And so I've grown up, um, you know, with, uh, it, it feels the best way to describe it is between worlds. And um, growing up, my parents moved to uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island uh, just before I was born. And so I didn't grow up in Squamish in my home territory. My dad is a hereditary chief uh, from the area, from Squamish. And so I really grew up in this climate of um, this, this, ongoing longing and narrative for going home and I didn't understand because I, I was home I was at my house you know where I was growing up with my family and as I grew up and became um, well I guess growing up both my parents really made uh, an, a conscious effort to have us connected to our Coast Salish heritage and family and you know many many weekends and holidays as a child were spent going and sitting and visiting with elders and you know my one of my dad's early teachings as a hereditary chief and leader was that you know he he held a responsibility to listen and to care for people and the way that he knew how to do that was to go and sit and spend time and and really you know open his heart and mind to what um, elders were sharing with him and, you know, mind you, this is all happening within a really, um, you know, complex and difficult time in terms of uh, the impacts of intergenerational trauma on language, on culture. And um, so for me, when I kind of decided um, that I wanted to go back to post-secondary and I had this experience of hearing Nancy's talk um, and these, you know, these things aligned for me. I started thinking back to when I was a child, spending time with my great aunt and uncle in Snanamath, um, Chester and Eva Thomas. And they lived right across from the, um, the river and they had a salmon smokehouse on their property and a huge garden. And every time we would go and spend time there, uh, I would just sit, you know, in the warmth of the smell of the wood fire, 
you know, seeing the jars of medicines on the counter and sharing these meals that nourished me. And I didn't know it at the time. I knew I loved visiting them. But when I thought about what it was I wanted to come back to, you know, as an adult and aware of my desire to connect more deeply to culture, it was these memories that came back and have stayed with me. And, you know, in a, in a Squamish teaching, um, it, you know, we're not alone. We have our ancestors, we have our family who are there supporting us and walking with us. And, and it's been really important to, um, you know, to keep those people in my heart and in my mind, because it's also, uh, it also, you know, helps me to understand how to carry the responsibility that comes with giving back, which is really another teaching that's been shared with me. Um, so finding my way to this knowledge from an academic um, path was, uh, you know, really a way of, of finding my way back to community. Because when I, especially when I um, started my master's, that was the first time that I had sort of entered back into Squamish as an adult. Um, and somebody who was coming with this, this skill set that I, I really wanted to offer um, to, sh to share and to uplift the knowledge renewal specifically with culturally important plants. And that was also, um, you know, a, a big marker in my own path of learning and reconnecting. And now I understand more clearly, you know, my own path of healing and grounding myself and my identity in my Coast Salish culture. Uh, so that I'm able to approach my work as an ethnobotanist from that place. Thank you. Yeah, and Nancy, I wanted to build on that. So Lee, as I hear you talking, it's, it's not about uh, often ethnobotany to me can feel like pieces. And you're talking about the wholeness, the wholeness of your journey and the wholeness of the smells and the scent and the sitting and the listening. and. Nancy, I wondered if you, I'd love to hear your thoughts coming from like the top down perspective about indigenous knowledge and the values that are in that and how that maybe differs from Western scientific practices. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Anne. Well, I grew up as a small child loving plants and nature in general, birds and um, natural history. Um, but when I went to uh, university, I studied botany. Uh, so as a scientist, my father was a scientist, an entomologist, and my grandfather as well. So I come from a, a family of Western scientists, in a way. Um, so when I started learning, uh, started my journey in ethnobotany, I realized that there was a whole body of knowledge that was not, um, I guess, factual knowledge, but was more within the realm of, um, I guess, emotion and thought. Um, it's hard to put it into words, but and it's something that's come to me gradually over time, that um, science and indigenous knowledge are not a one-to-one -one match at all, but rather indigenous knowledge systems that embody scientific knowledge, embody knowledge about plants, about their characteristics and animals and their characteristics and where they live and when they're ready to harvest and all of those things, that matches well with Western biological sciences. But for indigenous peoples, there's, there are whole other aspects of that knowledge that um, embody not, not just the knowledge itself, but how you learn about it, the ways of coming to knowledge um, and how you govern that knowledge, how you make decisions about that knowledge. So the governance systems, and most especially the values and worldviews that you bring to that knowledge. That's to me, I've come to see as the core, uh, what our friend Fikret Burkus calls sacred ecology is the, um, 
the respect, the values of respect and reciprocity and relationship that you bring um, and the perspective that you have is one that's been called, um, well, it, it, it's like everything is your, your relative. Kincentricity is what my friend Enrique Salmon and Dennis Martinez call it. Kincentricity, where it's everything around you is your relative, is your kin, especially living things. And, uh, and any biologist knows actually that that's true, that we are all related. We are all made of the same stuff. Um, that could be called star stuff, which that famous uh, uh, astronomer used to say. Um, but really we are all related to each other and we need to bring that knowledge with us when we're thinking about using plants for medicine or using any other living thing that there are relatives and they, um, we need to respect them as such. Their houses are the environment. We need to look after it. We wouldn't think of going into our grandmother's living room and trashing it, but we do that all the time with the homes of our relatives out there. I don't know if that answered your question. That's lovely, yeah. Lee, do you wanna? Yeah, I, um, I appreciate that so much, Nancy. And that's something that, uh, you know, this, I, this not idea, this teaching and this, you know, foundational um, way of being, which is that, you know, uh, looking at, at plants and all, all living, uh, you know, non-human life as, as relatives, really shifts, um, you know, the relationship. And I, through, through going, you know, taking both a Western scientific training um, path, you know, in my academic um, learning, as well as a culturally led, um, you know, mentored path uh, along it within my community and other indigenous communities that I've worked with, um, you know, it really is that, um, when we look at, you know, say a definition of ethnobotany uh, as the, the interrelationships between people and plants and so much more than the uses, I think, you know, it's so key to, even if that's not necessarily the background, you know, culturally that one comes from, I think what you just said in terms of, you know, from a, from a biological, um, you know, through a biological lens, looking at that, that just how, interconnected we are and how we do you know we do ourselves and and um you know non-human life a disservice by by forgetting that and so uh what i've found you know through my reconnection to plant relatives is that just as you mentioned you know it when you shift looking at uh, a western red cedar tree um when you shift looking at that tree as a resource um you know, having having some kind of worth um, in a monetary sense, and you think about that tree as a relative, uh, the relationship changes, and all of a sudden there's an element of reciprocity. Um, how is it that I'm in relationship with this relative? If this relative is interacting with me and offering me um, something as well, what is it that I offer? You know, is it care to the environment that this relative relies on? If I'm harvesting from this relative, how do I do that in a respectful and mindful way to think about the ongoing life, you know, of this tree? Um, and I think, you know, the, the responsibility piece is if I'm in relationship, then I carry responsibility. And if I have that responsibility, what is that? And how do I enact that in the work that I do, whether it's in you know, my day-to-day -day life, whether it's in the garden or whether you know, I'm utilizing this plant relative in some way. And so I think that you know, the teachings of, you know, and that, that ties into respect you know, and just how, what, what does that mean in this in the particular scenario? And so I think in terms of you know, conducting research with, um, culturally important plants, so much of that, 
process is, I believe, is a personal, um, you know, kind of um, turning in to look at what it means to, to be respectful, responsible, reciprocal um, in your research relationships. But that starts, you know, also with, uh, I'm sure there's, I'm sure everyone on this call has a deep love of plants and has your own, you know, you have your own story and your own particular plant species that carry that con connection. And I think turning to that place and, and working from that place in a research perspective and then shifting, you know, that what, what Robin Kimmerer talks about in terms of the honorable harvest, because when we look at these plants from a cultural perspective, there is a, um, you know, that, that interaction of harvesting and use. And, um, and so if we shift that to a research perspective, what does it mean to also carry those teachings in with the people that you're working with? And I think just, you know, what, the story that Nancy shared and the, the images that she shared of the elders and friends that she's worked with, um, it, it goes beyond, um, so far beyond having an informant, having, um, you know, going into a community with a mandate of what it is that you would like to learn. Uh, if you step back and you say, wait a second, I'm in, I'm in relationship here. How do you build meaningful, respectful relationships and how do you operate from that place? And so, um, you know, for me, something that's been taught to me by my community is, you know, you, you come with, with gifts and training um, and you meet, you know, a community in terms of where it is that they have an interest or a need and, um, and that, you know, helps to uphold that teaching of reciprocity in terms of, you know, in terms of research. And, and I just also want to touch on the, um, you know, on resilience. And when you're, you know, when you're working within an, an Indigenous context, um, you're working within, uh, you know, a very complex setting and a very complicated history. Um, you know, cultural plant knowledge has been directly impacted and access to culturally important harvesting sites, um, you know, access to healthy foods that nourish people, you know, spiritually, emotionally and physically. And so, um, you know, in terms of resilience, uh, there's so much um, resilience happening within Indigenous communities in terms of how people are connecting to their health and to their identity through land-based practices. And plants themselves offer so many teachings around resilience. And um, so I think I, I love to think about a plant like camas um, and, you know, a friend and colleague of both Nancy and mine, Cheryl Bryce, has done so much work in, in um, the Kwangan uh, territory to bring camas back but so much of what she's learned in just forging the difficult path of going out onto a landscape that is not welcoming to her in terms of harvesting and rebuilding those relationships as she's witnessed the resilience of that plant. She's witnessed the resilience of the people who tended to that plant and she's built up her own resilience through rebuilding that relationship. And so that's been guided you know, by Camus for her. And so I, I think those relationships are just such a, such a wonderful and powerful part of this work. Yeah, I'm reminded uh, just as Lee's talking about uh, my dear friend, Dr. Mary Thomas from the Shwetmuk Nation. I showed a photo of her and she, uh, I spent a lot of time with her over the years and she remembered her little she when she was a little girl she'd follow behind her grandmother she said her grandmother would walk through the woods talking to all of the plants and the trees just as if they were people and she would mention them by name and she would acknowledge them as she went through and that's the kind of relationship that uh, people have had with with the plants as um Robin Kimmer has written about and, and many others as well. And that's the kind of relationship that when you're harvesting uh, traditional medicine, I've watched Mary while well, she, um, she was harvesting the red osier dogwood uh, for, because they use the inner bark of the red osier dogwood as a poultice. And she walked up to the, to the bush and she talked to the bush and she asked for 
it to provide a branch. She left an offering of tobacco. Then she cut that branch and she scraped it and showed how to use it as a poultice. And um, she also used, she said that her father uh, never went to a dentist in his life because if he ever had a toothache, he used that particular medicine as a poultice. But she was one of the ones who was always so careful to acknowledge the plants. And that was from, from her teachings uh, from the time she was just a child. Brings back many memories of being out in the woods with her and, and others and seeing how respectful they, they are for harvesting any number of different plants. As I listen to both of you, and sorry if my internet is unstable, but hopefully you can hear me. Um, and I also think so of the reality of the world we live in, um, where there's not, where the, 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 it's not the red maple, it's board feet. Um, and Lee, as you were speaking, I thought, well, the focus on practice and if we each expand our, you know, bring that attention of reciprocity and respect, can we build out um, so that there's there, th that commodity driven approach isn't so dominant? I'm curious what each of you think or, or Lee, maybe perhaps in your work doing research in Squamish communities coming from, you know, around a Western scientific framework where you've had to actually specifically navigate between and negotiate between these different objectives and demands of each of those communities. If, if you have any ideas about that? Yeah, I think um, it's uncomfortable at times to come from um, you know, your own cultural lens and um, relation, you know, relationship driven sort of um, interactions with environment and, and place and then to, uh, to come up against very different ways of thinking about, um, you know, these environments and, and, uh, and so I can say that, uh, you know, as an Indigenous um, person going through, you uh, the you know Western scientific framework. It was it was very um, mixed for me. I, I had so many moments of just excitement and and you know in just being so inspired by learning about um, you know these species more in depth and um, have feeling like you know okay taking these courses in in plant biochemistry is really important because if I'm wanting to uplift and uphold the um, these teachings, these cultural teachings of plant medicines, for example, but this knowledge has been highly impacted. So, you know, people will need to be careful and cautious as we reconnect to these plants as medicine. Um, you know, these are some of the things that I that I held on to to make sense of um, what I was learning, you know, in a larger context. And so, in terms of, um, you know, I think. I think larger, you know, larger shifts. Uh, hopefully, you know, start from from smaller um, events and and learning about how it is to be in relationship, um, you know, with your environment because it's a lot easier to take more than you need and to you know get into the realm of of exploitation if you're not in relationship and if you don't feel that sense of responsibility. So. Um, you know, without sort of going too far down that path, I think that, uh, you know, there's so much to learn and reflect on. And I think at this particular point in time, you know, I think um, building the awareness that we are, you know, these, these relationships that we are a part of, whether, whether we acknowledge them or not, you know, are, are, um, are so important and that we all have the ability to make shifts to tend to relationships with the environment with um, plants and tend to ourselves you know through the the gifts and the medicines that are offered 
um, from our natural surroundings. Uh, yeah, I don't know, Nancy, what do you? Well, I I come back to Lee's use of the word resilience. I really like that that term, and and I think it conjures up for me the amazing ability of plants to uh, to recover from damage. And um, this is one of the things that uh, if we give plants half a chance, they're so powerful, they can regrow themselves. Um, and, and this is one of the keys to a lot of the traditional ways of looking after plant populations for indigenous peoples in the area where we work. And I think in many areas, probably all areas of the world to use uh, the plants themselves and their ability, their resilience and their ability to regenerate. When Mary took that piece of branch off the red osier dogwood, if we'd gone back the following year, we would find a new shoot growing there because they have what you could call the meristem bank. That is, um, they have tissues in different parts of them, whether it's in the roots or whether it's in the buds or whether it's in the cambium layer uh, that allows them to regenerate themselves. And so um, that's part of what gives me hope despite all of the damage that we've done to, to plants and that we continue to do, that uh, they have this amazing resilience capacity. And I think that's, uh, I guess it's one of the miracles that I, that I see in studying plants is as that and the miracle of photosynthesis, the fact they are our original solar panels and they do so much for us by capturing the sun's energy and bringing it to all of us so we can all survive. So that, that's just what I thought of when Lee talks about resilience. And Nancy, I think you mentioned when we were speaking on the phone before, but um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, of stories and how learning, not, can you hear me or no? Yes, we can hear you. Le learning uh, about okay. Just, stories. Uh, yeah, I'm curious what you each have to say about, um, which is a more personal way of learning and it, brings us into the practice of the relationship and um nancy i wondered what your what you want to share about story and plants right now well i mentioned that education and how people come to knowledge is part of the indigenous knowledge system and um for me there the way that we learn in western knowledge systems a lot of it is is sitting um, in a classroom with somebody talking to you. Um, whereas for indigenous peoples, uh, coming to knowledge is, comes in different ways. And one of the main ways is through stories. Stories embody a lot of knowledge and information. And I tend to use stories a lot. As you can tell, I've already told a few stories about Mary Thomas and about Adam Dick, um, but other stories as well that embody information that you can remember easily. And I, I think um, stories and ceremony, um, the ancient stories have em embraced lessons that, that we carry with us and um, so this, the ceremonial use of, of plants and the ceremony involved in the harvesting and the processing and the administration of indigenous medicine is, is, um, is a very important aspect to it all. It's, it's an important way of you know, maintaining those, those relationships of respect that go with it and it's an important way of educating people about the medicine itself 
so I think, um, yeah, stories, ceremonies, and the other, the third part of learning is participation, is actually doing it alongside and learning directly from someone who knows how to do it. And that's, um, I guess it would be like a practicum for a doctor, um, but there are all kinds of uh, ways in which younger people in indigenous communities can go alongside and can learn just by being there and observing and participating and helping in uh, harvesting and processing those medicines and eventually can actually take over from an older expert um, as we move through the generations. Anything to add there, Lee? Um, yeah, thank you for that. I, I, another thought that comes to mind, and this has been part of my, um, you know, reconnection with plants, is that uh, it's, you know, from a Squamish perspective, it's um, impossible to learn about plants without also learning about language, as mm -hmm. as it is, you know, um, and that leads to understanding. Um, you know, places and place names and the information, the very practical information that's embedded in language. And um, I think that part of my, um, my, my own process of reconnecting and learning has been, you know, it, it started with single, single words. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much a, you know, a very early learner in terms of my um, or my traditional language. Uh, but I guess one of the, the things that also comes to mind is that, um, you know, plant knowledge is, is one aspect that's so interconnected with, um, with story, with language, with law. Um, and I think also with, you know, in terms of um, how, how we carry ourselves, you know, as human beings and, and all of those aspects, you know, feed into, into us in terms of how we see the world. And from, there's a big resurgence of, of the Squamish language happening right now. And I've spoken with some younger people who say that, you know, as they learn the language and as they learn a different, um, basically terms of reference for understanding the world, there are certain things that they've always felt that can only be explained in Squamish, in the language as they're learning. And I think about that, you know, for me, um, for me when i when i go out and i um, spend time with plants and you know observing their environment their life cycle building that relationship and that intentionality that you mentioned you know um mary thomas taking and that you know holding her personal relationships up uh there's something that um you know connects deeply to uh to place to identity and i think that that um, you know that aspect of, of plant knowledge is is such an incredible um, healer, and I've seen that in the communities that I've worked with is um, you know just that you know yeah that that teaching that when we you know when we do connect to plants, especially um, a plant that we're going to take into our body to nourish us or to take as medicine, uh, that the intention and the relationship that you have with that plant at the time that you harvest it or the time that you prepare it is so key in terms of how that will, you know, uphold your health or your wellness. And so what that does is it aligns, you know, again, with that relationship and responsibility to be of a good heart and a good mind, if you're, especially if you're making a medicine to share with other people, and then really thinking, okay, if I'm harvesting this um, particular medicine, how do I take care of this and understand, you know, enough about the life cycle of this plant that it will be here for my grandchildren and my great grandchildren and so that this continuity can can continue on um, and yeah just one example in terms of language uh, you know we're in winter time here in in Squamish and the Squamish word for winter is uh, temtik and it translates um, you know most closely to the time when the Squamish river is low and the gravel bars are more exposed and the canoes run up on the gravel bars and so if you think about, um, you know, just the, the knowledge that is embedded in language, um, I think that's been a really big learning for me too. It, it's such an incredible way to connect to place and, and the messages and teaching, you know, of the, 
the shoulders of the people that that I stand on, my ancestors and the you know the people who really um, fought to keep this this knowledge here and present, so that myself and other people can learn from it and continue on um, the teachings. I call those people cultural refugia, the people who have hung on to that knowledge over time in, in difficult times um, are like the, the refugia in a glacier or in a fire or a flood, the areas that escaped and managed to maintain the life there. And then after the disturbance have spread themselves out across the land again. And that's what these amazing teachers are, Lee's teachers and my teachers who have managed to keep that knowledge alive, even despite all of the, the things that have happened to them over time. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm so profoundly grateful to them for sharing and, and being so generous with their knowledge and try to uh, share it in a responsible way according to what they, what they want. Thank you both. And there, there's a question that sort of follows on that, that also to me relates the, to the, the distinction you are making create producing medicine with intention that goes into the medicine and then you know herbal products global industry in the sense of taking those medicines um so this question is from alicia landman rayner and she asked if you to the different differentiate intercultural learning and the values of that um, and the benefits and cultural appropriation and um, is there a boundary between them? How is that difference? When is it appropriation and when is it reciprocity? Yeah, one of you can take that. Do you want to try, Lee? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, I think I in both my research and I'm also, uh, I have a small business, um, so I, I, um, I work with plants, culturally important plants, you know, in ways where by virtue of the work that I'm doing, it's sharing with a wider audience. And so I find that, you know, individually, I'm, I feel a great responsibility to listen to a really strong cultural teaching that is, you know, been shared with me that not all information is to be shared beyond community. And so from a research perspective, that means that some of my deliverables um, have a community version and have a, have a version that can be shared beyond that. And so, um, you know, I think that there's some very big examples, you know, currently um, both, both in, I would say, um, well, just in terms of, um, you know, over harvesting a particular plant set that capture a much larger interest. So white sage is an example um, where it's not so much about that intention and relationship and responsibility anymore. It's about, um, you know, popularity. And when something is popularized like that, there's inevitably going, and the d demand goes up, there's inevitably going to be, um, you know, really complicated things that happen and impacts that happen there. Similarly with cultural appropriation, um, you know, I think that as, as it's, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, everybody here has a love of plants. Everybody here has an admiration, you know, for relationship with plants, I, I imagine. And within that admiration and within that, you know, those, those intentions of reconnecting and, and maybe integrating some of these, you know, plants into whether it be our, our lives or teaching or businesses, there's a real responsibility to um, learn about what it means to be culturally appropriative. Because if you, if you are going down that path, um, it likely means that you're not necessarily um, 
you know, very informed about the origin of those practices and relationship. And maybe that means that you're not honoring, you know, those, those relationships and what that means to the community that, that or communities that hold those relationships is it's upholding, um, it's upholding damage. Uh, and so it's really, you know, it's, it's really important to be aware of that to, and if you feel like you're not sure what cultural appropriation means, um, you know, I think it's really important to do our own personal work. And this is a time right now where we can all do that. And, uh, and it's, um, so that that's one piece. And I think in terms of celebrating, you know, um, celebrating and, and cross-cultural learning, uh, it, it is, it's probably a bit of a case by case basis. I mean, there's, there's some, I think there's some, you know, situations where it's very clear that, um, you know, that knowledge has been taken without the, the cultural context and grounding. And, um, and I think, you know, those situations are really problematic. I think there's also a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot that happens uh, at a larger, you know, scale where where people learn about the incredible, you know, antioxidants or the incredible, you know, purification or antibacterial activity or you know these aspects of plants, and you know, yes, it's exciting, um, but then the question is, is how to engage, you know, in those um, relationships in an ethical way, and I think that the answer is sometimes we just don't and. Uh, and I get this question a lot in communities I work with is, you know, okay, if we talk about these plants with you, um, how do we know they're not going to be um, exploited? How do we know that a patent isn't going to be put on this medicine? And then, you know, we'll feel like we don't have, uh, you know, access to this plant anymore. And so those are, I don't have clear answers. All I can do is, is follow my own ethical responsibilities of listening to the community and then deciding how it is that I um, share, you know, knowledge and often that comes from a very personal aspect of this is my path, you know, as an Indigenous woman coming from Coast Salish territory and these are some of my teachings that I'm allowed to share. So it's a great question and I think there's also some really good resources out there in terms of um, you know, uh, just also the the pre learning that goes into this, you know, from my area of study, which is really understanding what it means to decolonize relationships with place and with, you know, in this in this uh, context with plants, and that is a very personal. There's a very personal aspect to that process. It was a long answer, but I hope it touches on some of the points. Thanks, Lee. I don't I don't have much to add except that. We all have a huge responsibility in doing this work um, to ask permission, to collaborate, to make sure that what you're doing is what people want. And I've been told by people I've worked with um, over the years that in the past, they wouldn't have shared this knowledge and they wouldn't want it to be out there, but because uh, it's very hard to pass it along through the normal family lines because of life circumstances that they think they don't want that knowledge to be lost. And in a sense, um, it's not always the case and it's very complicated as Lee says, but in publishing information with the knowledge holder uh, acknowledged uh, it would be very hard for someone to turn around and patent that knowledge um, when it's when it's in the public domain like that. But uh, I, I noticed that Kelly Bannister uh, made a note on uh, on the chat line, and uh, Dr. Kelly Bannister is uh, is someone who has really looked at these questions of ethics and medicine and plant knowledge very carefully and was one of the people who spearheaded the International Society of Ethnobiology's um, uh, Code of Ethics. And I think that that Code of Ethics is really excellent uh, to, to look at and to follow. Um, it, it talks about these very issues that we all face.
Thank you both. Um, yeah, and Lee, the chat, I'm appreciating addressing that. And it's and then, um, Claudia, and that will continue, you know, how to honor and respect and share and carry forward um, in a collaborative way that respects what we're standing on. Um, historic um, is more over the winter and I'm hoping Kelly Ben speakers as well. Mm -hmm. To the end of the hour, we could keep talking and talking. There's so many things I'd love to um, ask you and hear you speak more about. I wonder if you have any just closing words um, that you'd like. I, I just um, want to say thank you to, to Lee uh, for being willing to come on and talk uh, about these important topics with me. And uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, you're amazing. And thank you, Anne, and all the others and all people attending. We really appreciate your interest in this. Yeah, I just want to um, you know, raise my hands to Nancy as my teacher, my mentor, and my friend. And you know, thank you so much for all that you have um, just demonstrated in terms of you know generous, loving, and reciprocal relationships with the people that you work with um, and with myself. You know, I really appreciate that deeply. Uh, and I thank you so much, you know, to Anne and to everybody who organized this. I'm really, um, yeah, it's, it's a real honor to sit with Nancy and to just be in conversation and to be able to share uh, the learning that I'm doing around, you know, these aspects. And um, it's not necessarily easy because it will come up against some, um, you know, some expectations and the ways that things um, you know, I think have been done in the past in terms of research, but it's a very essential aspect, I think, to have a more um, Indigenous voices, you know, at the table. And so I'm just grateful to Nancy for upholding that, you know, aspect of, of my work. So, yeah. Hi, Chika. Thank you. Thank you both so much. And thank everyone for joining us again for this webinar. Um, and we'll be sharing a link to the room um, later today. So thank you all very much. Thanks.